All right, so that we get out on time and have enough time for questions, I'm going to ask for discipline and uh, ask us to focus. Um, welcome. I'm so glad that you all came here in physical presence, and welcome to those of you who are viewing us on our live webcast. Um, my name is Christine Haight Farley, and I'm a professor here. I teach intellectual property law, I teach trademark law, um, and so therefore, I'm very interested in this case. Uh, this is a series that we're doing now in which we are taking advantage of our Washington location and uh, doing a quick uh, Supreme Court recap. So when the Supreme Court hears an IP case, uh, we're extending an invitation to the lawyers who've argued the case, lawyers who have written amicus briefs in the case, um, to come to the law school and talk to our students and our professors about the case. Um, so we're, uh, this has been a great success, and we're happy to be able to do it in this case of, uh, 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 that we have today, Nike versus Already. Um, I will give a brief introduction, um, especially brief um, for my colleagues, introduction of our speakers today. And I have a couple of questions to keep us on track so that we get out to you the information that you want to have about this case. Um, and we will definitely leave ample time for questions. Uh, so uh, uh, note those questions and, and hold on to them. Um, so I think what I'll do is I will introduce our, our distinguished guest first, and then, and then I'll introduce my colleagues. Um, this is uh, uh, James Dabney, who is a litigation partner at the law firm of Fried Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson. Um, he's the head of the firm's intellectual property and technology practice, um, and he has um, quite a record of uh, being on some very important cases and on the winning side of some very important IP cases. Um, and it looks like uh, from his bio that he has uh, personally argued uh, two quite famous intellectual property cases before the Supreme Court, uh, KSR International versus Teleflex in 2007, and Holmes Group versus Vornado Air Circulation in 2002. Um, We're extremely happy um, to have him come. Um, I can't imagine how exhausting a day he must have had already arguing this case this morning. Um, we're extremely happy that he uh, stayed around and, and came to the law school uh, to talk with us about it. Uh, we, uh, in the interest of fairness, um, it, uh, extended an invitation to the lawyer representing Nike, who was unable uh, to be here today. Um, so we would have liked to have both sides represented, um, but we weren't able today. Um, but we have um, some, uh, we've drawn the experts of the faculty to come as well. Um, so uh, we have Amanda Frost, my colleague here, who will help us um, primarily with the Nike argument. Um, so Professor Frost teaches civil procedure and federal courts and is going to help us understand the jurisdiction argument that Nike made. And we also have my colleague uh, Jonas Anderson, who teaches and writes in the area of patent law um, to help us think about the broader implications of these rules about jurisdiction um, when cases are brought and then um, uh, settled or attempted to be withdrawn. Um, so without further ado, I wonder if I could ask you, Jim, if you would tell us uh, briefly what the case was about so we can get a sense of the nutshell of what the case is. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, the case was brought uh, by Nike in 2009. They filed a five-count federal court complaint alleging that the defendant's sale of Yum's branded athletic footwear uh, infringed a registered trademark of Nike, diluted a registered trademark of Nike, uh, violated Section 43A of the Lanham Act, uh, was dilution under the New York general business law, and was unfair competition under New York common law. All five of those torts were allegedly committed by the sale of footwear under the Yum's brand. Um, the response to the suit was to deny infringement and to counterclaim for a judgment declaring, number one, the plaintiff did not have a trademark. It was trying to uh, apply trademark principles to a shoe, which was trademark ineligible subject matter. 
uh, and that the registration uh, that it had obtained of this shoe as a trademark should be canceled. So we had a complaint and we had a counterclaim and we had nine months of litigation uh, at the conclusion of which the plaintiff undertook uh, a fairly well-known evasive maneuver that uh, dates to 1995 in the patent field. Uh, but the plaintiff attempted to oust the court of jurisdiction to hear the counterclaim by filing a motion that said two things. One is, judge, I've changed my mind. I want you now to enter judgment against me on the merits. I want you to dismiss all five of my claims for relief with prejudice so that there's a judgment against me on the merits. And not only that, I have written out and delivered free of charge to the defendant a document that says covenant not to sue, in which I promise I will never, ever, ever again sue the defendant based on any law, state or federal, based on the appearance of any footwear the defendant has ever made or any, quote, colorable imitations thereof, unquote. Full stop. This was a very unusual and, in the view of some, a little reckless move because the plaintiff was unilaterally disarming itself. There was no settlement. There was no agreement. This was just a unilateral voluntary act whose obvious purpose was to try to destroy the Article III jurisdiction of the court. The lower courts held uh, that the maneuver was successful. And the lower courts held that uh, when Nike abandoned all of its claims and promised not to sue for infringement but did not give up, the government registration of its purported trademark, there was no longer any Article III, quote, capital C case, unquote, that would enable the court to hear and determine the merits of the counterclaim, and therefore, however inefficient and unfair and, and, and you know, contrary to the contemplation of the federal rules of civil procedure it might be to have multiple piecemeal adjudications rather than a single decision in a single case, um, they were going to dismiss the compulsory counterclaim uh, for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. The uh, defendant already petitioned the Supreme Court for review on the ground that the lower courts very clearly did not apply the body of law that governs mootness. And for those of you who've taken advanced federal courts, the standards for holding that an already pending case has become moot are not identical to the standards for determining whether someone can walk into court in the first instance and have initial standing to sue. The standards differ in two ways. The, differs, the standards differ in terms of the stringency with which the injury in fact element of the Article III case test is applied. And most importantly, the standard places the burden of proof on the party asserting mootness, not on the party seeking to invoke jurisdiction in the first instance. So the courts applied what we contended was the wrong legal standard. They placed the wrong burden of proof on the wrong party. They asked the wrong question. They got the wrong answer. And the court in June granted a petition for writ of certiorari that already had filed. And the question was, in substance, is a federal district court divested of article jurisdiction uh, if the plaintiff promises not to assert uh, its uh, trademark uh, against then existing commercial activities of the defendant. And that's the question that we were arguing about today.
So um, I unfortunately had to teach trademark law this morning during yes. your argument, um, <laughs> but my colleague uh, Professor Anderson was there uh, to watch the argument, and I know Professor uh, Frost read the transcript. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something very difficult, which is to tell us how brilliant you were today in the oral <laughs> argument, or if you could give us some uh, account of what what you uh, what what you saw happening in terms of what the <coughs> justices seem to be primarily interested in. Well, um, you when you argue in the Supreme Court, you uh, come to expect that you will have very little time before they start interrupting you. And so you have a script written out, which I brought with me. It's got, you know, it's, it's like Schroeder's security blanket. You do it, so you have it. But you know you're never going to use any but the very, very beginning part of it. Uh, and I was somewhat pleasantly surprised. We worked on it to try to get, you know, the nub of the case uh, out there at the beginning. And, and uh, the way we saw the case uh, was uh, two questions. One, whether loss of freedom to operate, which is a patent law uh, term. That's, that's what people are are asked all the time. I want you to give me an opinion that I have freedom to operate. So we said, is loss of freedom to operate on the part of a direct competitor a form of injury in fact that qualifies as injury in fact under Article 3? That's the, that's the threshold question in the case because that's what happens when someone procures a government registration that disables and disadvantages and places obligations on competitors not to use something. And the second question is, what party bears the burden of proof of facts that are contended by it to render the case moot? And this is the burden of proof issue. So those were the two things. And I was pleasantly surprised when I was actually able to speak for almost a minute <laughs> uh, before someone interrupted at me. And I guess it was, I was reminded it was Justice Kennedy who did. Um, the questioning was, uh, there, were, there were several justices who uh, uh, seemed quite receptive by their questions uh, to the uh, position uh, that uh, the petitioner was advocating. I would say the most vocal of the uh, of the questioners, uh, who seemed to be uh, quite uh, aware of uh, the kind of the commercial, the practical commercial reality of this. Uh, was Justice Kennedy, who was the first questioner and who asked uh, many questions in which he seemed to think that it was uh, uh, not only not moot, but the solution that the lower court seemed to adopt, namely that the plaintiff, or the counterclaim plaintiff already, instead of getting a judgment of invalidity that says this thing is gone, it's extinguished, terminated, done, I don't have to worry about it anymore. If I want to bring, off, bring out a shoe that's similar to it or identical to it under my brand, I can. I don't have to worry about, you know, well, is this shoe going to be uh, diluting or infringing or unfair competition or anything. Uh, and Justice Kennedy's view seemed to be that um, to say that uh, a litigant in already's position uh, should lose its right to have an Article III court decide that issue because it has been made an involuntary licensee of the alleged wrongdoer is not only uh, a concept that, that has no basis in the court's precedence, but it also gives the, the involuntary licensor an advantage because now uh, the, the covenant not to sue and, and covenants not to sue have long been regarded as the practical equivalent of a non-exclusive license. You know, I'm just not going to sue you. So uh, I'm giving you, an, uh, you know, a limited non-exclusive license so that instead of having your rights determined by the standards of law and by the judgment and orderly process, the situation now is that already has been given a new overlord. Uh, we now have a new... Uh, a new overseer, so that if we want to do something, uh, we don't go to court or we, we don't uh, judge our conduct by, by reference to the law, we have to decide whether or not this private sector party who uh, is our direct rival in the business, whether they will form a judgment that uh, they have no objection or they think that what we're doing is or is not going to be a colorable imitation of one of our own prior shoes. 
Uh, and one of the real uh, incoherent uh, aspects of, uh, of the case is that when Nike wrote out and delivered this unilateral document that was said to moot out the case, they came up with this phrase, colorable limitations, which is uh, a trademark law term of art. It's also a term of art found in the, in the design patent law. But what it means in trademark law, which is what this case supposedly is, although it's really a patent case masquerading as a design patent, uh, as, a, uh, as a trademark case, is a colorable limitation of a mark is one that's likely to cause confusion as to the origin of the product that bears the mark. Well, here, the colorable limitation concept in this covenant is supposed to apply to another model of the same originator. So it's, it's kind of a, almost an absurd thing to say, well, this shoe is going to be a colorable limitation in the sense that it's going to cause confusion as to source, but it's from the same source. In other words, this is a problem when somebody does a made-for-litigation evasive maneuver that has no basis in commercial practicalities, nothing anybody would ever agree to. This is just some very, very clever litigating lawyer's way to try to, to uh, import into trademark practice a, a, a 1995 vintage maneuver that originates in the patent law. Uh, and um, Justice Ginsburg, interestingly, asked, how long has this been around? Because I'd made a statement during my, uh, I guess it was, uh, I think during my point, that this was only a 17-year-old rule, which is true. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, was, I, I was surprised at the degree of grilling I got from Justice Breyer. He, uh, all the justices seemed to agree that the wrong burden of proof had been applied. And all the justices seemed to agree that uh, the uh, elevated burden of proof that governs mootness determinations when they're grounded on the voluntary act of someone who's trying to bootstrap his way into mootness. Those are, it's, it's very hard for somebody to say, ha ha, I have pulled the rug out from under you. The courts have been pretty rough on that. And it seems pretty clear that all the justices uh, seem, the ones who spoke up anyway, seem to be um, uh, accepting of the idea, which the Solicitor General had argued, by the way, that this case was governed by the voluntary cessation doctrine and the precedence of mootness that, uh, that involved the, the Voluntary Post-Suit Act by letting it. Um, and, but Justice Breyer seemed quite interested in, in some of the granular, uh, more granular aspects of the case. and. Uh, and asking questions which, uh, to a practitioner, uh, are surprising because uh, in, in practice, historically, they would not have made that much difference. Well, they're asking questions, well, uh, well, if he says he wants to make the shoe, is, is that enough? Does that, uh, you know, I mean, talk is cheap. Uh, but it was like uh, legal questions, were, uh, the, 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 the suggestion that Nike has made is, well, the real problem in this case is that, is that the uh, already, um, five weeks after we delivered this covenant abruptly and said the case is over, uh, well, they didn't come out and reveal plans to do that which we had been stridently saying they had no right to do, i.e., to make an exact replica, uh, a Yum's brand version of the particular shoe shown in their registration. And so the suggestion seemed to be that, well, there was just some you know, we, you know, why don't we just say that, well, you know, why don't we just announce a public plan to do that? Uh, and, um, you know, maybe legal consequences will turn on that, maybe they won't, but uh, the proper answer to that question, I think, is that when you're talking post-commencement mootness, it's the party arguing mootness who has to prove that his adversary has no interest in doing anything that's restrained. So it wasn't for us to come in and say, well, despite everything that you've done, I have this secret plan over here that you know you didn't know about, so you didn't know to write your covenant that it was going to cause the termination of this. Uh, so uh, we just think that that um, uh, at the end of the day, I, I think that uh, if you just apply the straight three-part test uh, of Article Three standing, uh, you'll get the right result in this case. And you didn't ask me this, but I. I uh, 
At some point, I would like to talk a little bit about the two parallel universes as to why the Supreme Court has now three times in 20 years taken up the question of what is a case uh, in the context of, of patent and trademark law. I, wanted, I, I want at some point to grill you on a trademark question. Okay. But um, your statement about this is a patent case masquerading as a trademark case yes. gives me a segue to uh, Professor Anderson. Um, and I don't know if you want to address that point, but um, – I wonder about the larger implications for this scenario of bringing a case, withdrawing a case, is there jurisdiction, and how you see it from the patent world. Right. Um, before I get into that, let me just, uh, Jim's probably too modest to mention this, but one interesting thing at the argument was after his one-minute uh, soliloquy at the start, it was so effective that the first question was essentially Kennedy saying, okay, I write this opinion in your favor, how do I do it? Right. That, was, that was the first question. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jim also mentioned this really is a, a patent case. And the reason he says that is because uh, all these plans, that, or, or, all these strategies Nike employs here to get out of court uh, were originated uh, by patent plaintiffs. Um, and the, the real case that this case, I think, is attacking, although not doesn't explicitly state in the briefs, um, was a case called SuperSAC, which the Federal Circuit said in 1995 that if a, um, a patent holder brought an uh, infringement suit, uh, later a counterclaim for invalidity came, that if they sent a letter saying that they wouldn't uh, enforce the patent against that particular plaintiff and that particular plaintiff's or defendant's um, embodiments, then that removed the controversy from the court. So even though there were still some invalidity arguments in the counterclaim, those were taken out of the court's jurisdiction. So I think that the first thing this case does is directly attack that line of cases, which is now the standard in, in patent litigation. That's what everyone does. It's, it's standard practice. It's well known. Um, the second thing I, I think it does directly is, is with design patents. I mean, this looks like it should have been a design patent rather than a trademark is what Nike should have done. Here. There are probably reasons they didn't. Um, I don't know the details as well as Jim does. He can probably tell you why they didn't do that. Um, but it seems, and Nike owns, Nike used Would to be. Would have expired being one. Right, right. Would have expired, well. Uh, 1982. 1982. Right. <laughs> Would have expired. Long expired. And whether it was obvious or not, who knows. Um, either way, uh, Nike owns a lot of design patents. For a long time, they were the leading design patent filer in the world. That's changed recently, um, but they still have a lot of design patents. So they're heavily involved in design patent litigation and acquisition. Um, so this. I think directly challenges how design patents are used by businesses and industry. And there's one thing I'll say that's maybe an indirect impact of this, but maybe uh, also a larger impact, is, is the way it affects declaratory judgment actions in patent law. Um, so a lot of my students here are familiar with the Myriad case um, in which the ACLU, among other people, brought a suit against Myriad, essentially asking the court to declare their patents on some genetic tests invalid. Um, now, Declaratory judgment standing is, is slightly different than, than mootness here, but it is a very related issue and an Article III issue. Um, and a lot of declaratory judgment suits happen in patent law for a number of reasons. One, you want to invalidate patents. Two, you want to end up in a different court. You don't want to be in Texas. You want to be in California. So you want to start the litigation. Um, I think that this case has the potential, depending on how it's written, to impact uh, the way that declaratory judgment works in patent law, which is, I think is the, the <coughs> broader application of how this could um, completely change the way patent litigation and, and patent acquisition occurs. Um, so I'll, I'll probably stop there with those three, but I think that's the way that the patent truly really bubble up in this trademark case. Okay. Um, so we need to ask uh, Professor Frost the question of whether there is a case or controversy here. I don't know if you want to pretend you work for Nike. And I almost wore my spot, sneakers. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to bring my, my actual Nikes, but, um, and I decided I wasn't fit enough probably to be Nike's attorney. But I will try for a moment anyway to embody Nike and make their argument, and then I will maybe comment a little bit mm -hmm. either now or, or in subsequent questions and answers about the Article Three uh, question here. Um, so just first principles, which Nike starts its brief with, um, should be familiar to you all that federal courts can't hear um, any uh, dispute and can't decide any uh, dispute unless there's a quote unquote case or controversy. That language comes from Article 3 of the Constitution and the federal courts have read that to mean that there must be injury in fact traceable to the defendant's conduct that can be remedied by a court. And the reason for that requirement is that courts need, it's a separation of powers concern, that courts need to 
cabin their power and they can't be a roving commission that goes out and addresses issues and pronounces on hypothetical questions or policy questions in the way that a legislature can. So those are the first principles. There's actually very interesting questions as to whether those, the, the strength of that Article III case or controversy requirement, that standing requirement, applies in the same way in the middle of a case when it becomes moot or arguably becomes moot. That's a point that Mr. Dabney made and that Nike um, seeks to avoid because it's not a strong point for, for Nike here. And the argument is that the strength of your standing is, needs to be um, very high at the beginning of a case, but at the mootness stage, the case maybe can continue without having quite the same concrete and particularized injury that you would need to start the litigation. Um, so here, uh, Nike's brief, I'll be very brief here, is, is actually really a one-note brief, and I don't say that in, um, to disparage it. It's a strong note, which is um, the reason that this uh, case is now moot is that its opponent already has never stated a uh, plan or even an intention or desire to create or build a product that would then be sub subjected to suit by Nike. So there's absolutely no reason for them to care about whether or not this patent is validated um, or because they have no future plans to in create a sneaker that would go beyond the terms of the covenant and might possibly subject them to suit. And they further state that the burden shouldn't be and cannot be on them to show that already doesn't plan to make, make such a sneaker because how could Nike possibly show what somebody else, some other company, plans or intends to do, right? It's asking Nike to try to prove what Already's future plans are would be impossible. Already should have some obligation to come back and say it intends to create such a shoe. And indeed, this was the focus of questioning at the argument, and uh, Mr. Dabney, I thought you did a terrific job uh, based on reading the transcript, and I thought the most amusing moment was when you tried to say something about in the real world, everyone knows that this would basically impinge on our ability to engage in the business of creating shoes, and there's plenty of evidence in the record that my, my, my client plans to uh, design and sell sneakers. And Breyer responded, I don't care about the real world. I care about the record, <laughs> which is a very judge-like thing to say. Um, uh, and um, I, you know, I thought you handled yourself very well, but that's where Breyer was coming from. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think Nike's case turns on whether or not the justices think that there was some burden or obligation on behalf of Already to show that it intends to create not just any shoe, but shoes that might potentially subject it to suit by Nike. And I, I could say a lot more about the standing issue, but why don't I, I stop well, there? And you said you wanted to comment on... Would you like me to comment yeah, a little bit on the yeah. standing question? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think this is a, a really interesting point, which is... To what degree does mootness differ from the Article III case or controversy requirement that exists at the start of a case and that we know as standing? And for the longest time, the Supreme Court said, um, quoting from uh, law professor Henry Monahan, who'd written a seminal article on this, they said, um, mootness is standing in a time frame, meaning basically that the case or controversy requirement, the injury traceable to defendant's conduct that must be redressable by a court that exists at the beginning of a case and must exist, for an Article III court to hear it, must continue to exist throughout the case, that same requirement, the same three uh, requirements. And then, in this case, Friends of the Earth versus Laidlaw, the court said, no, we actually think a little differently, or we're going to articulate it a little differently. The standard for getting into court is different for the standard than the standard for staying in court. And they have really good arguments for why that's so, which is you've got judicial resources expended, the party's times or time has, has been uh, devoted to this case already. Um, you've got the fact that there's certainly a concrete setting for the case. That's how you got into court, is that there was at one point in time a concrete dispute. And there's this lurking concern of manipulating the courts. And I certainly think that's a concern lurking in this case. Was Nike seeking to threaten and scare off competitors and then back away quickly and leave that threat of litigation hanging out there without any judicial decision to guide uh, future conduct. And I think that was lurking in the back of the case and certainly of concern uh, to the justices. Um, in, in terms of thinking about the broader implications for this case and the ruling, um, were there amicus briefs filed in the case? And, yes. and what were the concerns raised by the amici? Um, there were two law professor briefs that were filed on the petitioner's side. Uh, there was the brief of the solicitor general that was filed also sort of nominally on the petitioner's side, but they were sort of taking a middle ground in the case. 
Uh, and then basically all of the intellectual property owning organizations filed in support of uh, the respondent. Uh, and there were two uh, private sector companies, Volkswagen uh, and uh, Levi's, who uh, also filed on, on the side of the respondent. And uh, of course, trying to extend uh, uh, non patent protection to things like taillight lenses and automobile fenders is a, is a subject near and dear to. Uh, uh, to the likes of, of Volkswagen of America. So it's easy to see why an amici like that might favor curtailment of federal court jurisdiction to review the legitimacy of these kinds of trademark claims. Um, having said that, um, the reason the Supreme Court has been called now three times in 20 years to decide how do we know if there's a case in a patent or now this trademark case, you know, this patent case masquerading as a trademark case, uh, is because in the Federal Circuit era, there has been this parallel universe of standing. Uh, Professor Frost spoke of the three-part test of Article Three standing as if that is universally understood to be the test of, of when a case exists. And I'm here to tell you that that was not applied in patent cases, and still isn't. Uh, you had in patent cases uh, what was known up through 2007 as the reasonable apprehension of suit test, uh, in which the existence of a case was not determined by whether the plaintiff complained of injury caused by what the defendant was doing and redressable by a judgment, such as a judgment of invalidity. That was the test applied everywhere outside the Federal Circuit. The, three part, the, federal, the, the, the federal Circuit test said, uh, has the person seeking relief uh, alleged that he is himself, its or for herself, in reasonable apprehension of suit for infringement, and has that person also taken uh, significant meaningful steps towards uh, engaging in infringing acts? It's not too hard to see that the position being argued by Nike, especially with regard to this demand for disclosure of plans, etc., is simply a reworded and heavily disguised version of the reasonable apprehension of suit two-part test that was thought by many to have been explicitly disapproved in the Metamune case. The Metamune case was the second of the three cases that the Supreme Court has taken up. The first one was Cardinal Chemical, and the third one is already. And in every one of those cases, the reason why you had an issue over the word case is because the three-part test was not applied in any of those cases. The three-part test, you can read the Second Circuit's decision in this case, you won't find the three-part test. You can read the district court opinion in this case, you won't find the three-part test. What they did was they applied the language of metamute, but the substance of what was done was the reasonable apprehension of suit test. So the government, the Solicitor General in this case, says, well, there has to be a genuine threat of enforcement as a sine qua non of uh, Article III jurisdiction. Well, if you think about that, a genuine threat of enforcement is what gives rise to a reasonable, reasonable apprehension of suit. So it's simply a repackaging of the two-part test. And by the way, you have to have concrete plans as a sine qua non. Well, meaningful steps taken towards it. So it's, it's amazing that, that uh, whereas, uh, you know, when, when John Dudas was the director of the Patent Office and the, uh, uh, the Solicitor General would come in and take this strong view in the Metamune, here it is, uh, it's, a, it's a brave new world and uh, uh, now uh, there seems to be, although it is not stated as such, uh, it, is, it is very, uh, to my uh, way of thinking, uh, what the government is arguing in this case, is in essence the same standard uh, that was applied in SuperSAC, that was applied and disapproved in the Federal Circuit in the Metamune case. 
uh, and I am, uh, you know, uh, I don't know whether the Supreme Court will see it. The, the Supreme Court justices today did not seem particularly receptive to the arguments that the Solicitor General was making. Um, so I don't know, but... Uh, uh, let, let me, let me yeah. follow up on that. So one, one interesting strategy point, maybe you can talk about yeah. when you're up there and you, you've def certainly thought about this. And, and <laughs> a lot of the justices were trying to ask you, what could Nike have done here? What, what would, you're, you're arguing it wasn't sufficient to, to divest the court of jurisdiction. And the court wanted to know, well, what Nike could have done? And I think it was Justice, Chief Justice Roberts who asked, um, is the only, could Nike have done anything short of saying this trademark is invalid? We will not enforce it against anyone that would have divested the court of jurisdiction. And you said no. And, it, and he had a look on his face of, I never get a straight answer. That's, that's, that's a one word answer. And he paused for a moment and moved on. Um, so, but, but, so what's the strategy behind that? And, and that's a very distinct line saying that that's all they could have done um, instead of couching it in maybe some, some caveats or factual issues. Why, why did you want to go all the way on, on that issue? Um, experience as a practitioner. Um, Nike is trying to have it both ways, as are all of the plaintiffs who try to use this covenant device, because it's not a new thing that a person who holds a patent or a registered trademark, if he's going to lose, wants to lose in a way that will allow him to live and come back and fight another day. So if he's going to lose, he wants to lose because his claim was waived, which is what Nike did, or because there was non-infringement, which is what was held in the Cardinal Chemical case and, and, and in the Altvater case. They don't want to lose because their patent is invalid or their registration is invalid because then it's all over and they can't live to fight another day. So it's not exactly a new thing that uh, a litigant in the respondent's position would want to try to uh, suffer as small a loss as it could. Um, the problem is that the very smallness of the loss leaves intact this very public record and this very public registered claim of right to exclude competition, which continues to act as a source of cost and risk and loss of freedom to operate on the part of everybody else. And it's very well and good to say, I know that it can't be enforced against me. Uh, but what I said in, in, in a moment, which uh, is, is one of the few times when I sort of tried to, to signal to the justices that um, I practice law outside the Supreme Court, and I, <laughs> I, I therefore have, a, you know, a, in some ways, a more diverse set of legal experiences to fall back on to try to, to explain why something matters. I said to the justices, questions trademark practitioners get asked all the time is, is this mark available? It's called an availability search. Is it available? Now, of course, I would say it's nonsensical to speak of a shoe as a mark of itself. It's, it's sort of, you know, we, we hear the word mark, we hear the word counterfeit. Uh, I mean, there's all this trademark lingo that is being used totally disconnected from the context in which it originated. Um, but it's a public record, and it is unrealistic, totally unrealistic, to think that a small company like already can uh, disabuse all of the millions of people who look at the principal register of the Patent and Trademark Office uh, or hear about this registration and immediately conclude that this must be the property of Nike. And uh, who wants to, to uh, be an infringer or to sell something that someone has no right to sell? I mean, people so obey I the law. I have a solution for you. Yeah. Uh, you go to the USPTO and you seek a cancellation of the registered trademark. There's well, no talk of this. <laughs> um, 
There are several. That, that was an argument that Nike made. That was an argument that the INTA strenuously made. They, of course, uh, looking out for the incomes of lawyers who concentrate in trademark office. And I thank them for doing uh, that. Uh, <laughs> pre, uh, proceedings. Um, there are several uh, problems with that. Uh, I did not dwell on that in my argument because it is so obviously extraneous to the Article Three question. Uh, this is a question that's been brought up. Well, even if you reject us on Article 3, you should include in your opinion some dictum that tells the district judge that he has equitable discretion to relegate uh, already to a cancellation proceeding in the, in the Patent and Trademark Office. I think it's very unlikely we'll get the dictum or any such suggestion in the opinion. Uh, but the reason why that is... But why do you need the dictum anyway? Why aren't you just free to go and bring a cancellation proceeding? First of all, the Patent and Trademark Office has no statutory or constitutional jurisdiction to extinguish Nike's common law claim of right to exclude already from using this design. Uh, the Patent and Trademark Office has no jurisdiction to decide rights of use, and they say that all the time. And they usually say that in the reflexive suspension orders that they issue the moment they get the first whiff that there's a parallel litigation out there precisely because they know their jurisdiction is so limited uh, and they know that, that they, can, they have no ability to provide a complete determination of the party's rights and obligations. All they can do is to expunge a registration, but in this course I emphasized at the beginning they filed a five count complaint the PTO would have no authority to deal with four of the five. They would have no jurisdiction at all to deal with the state law claims at all. And on top of all of that, the losing party in a TTAB proceeding, if they're the holder of the registration sought to be canceled, can go into district court and start all over again with new evidence and introduce new evidence. So it's just one complete and total and expensive, hugely expensive uh, detour. Uh, we were going to, uh, we were like 65 days away from, from the discovery cutoff in this case. <laughs> there was no efficiency to be gotten uh, by uh, aborting the, uh, the, the very advanced litigation and starting all over in the CD. But so so there, there is no way that the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board could do anything other than adjudicate a tiny piece of this in a non-final way that would be subject to de novo judicial review. So at most we'd have, we'd split it up into multiple things. We'd get, you know, a non-final decision of the TTAB. And one of the most important questions that was raised today, which points out an inconsistency in the respondent's position, and this is what Kennedy was all over the government, and Kennedy was all over the, the respondent, which is, when you go to district court and you're disappointed with the result of a PTO refusal to cancel, isn't there article jurisdiction then, article three jurisdiction then? Are you saying now for the first time that it's not enough that you believe you are or will be damaged by a registration and, and you seek review of the contrary to law decision of the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board? You now, in order to get judicial review, you have to say, well, I've got concrete plans to make use of the subject matter registered uh, in the trademark registration. That would be absolutely unprecedented. Federal courts, district courts, courts of appeals have been hearing appeals from PTO trademark trial and report decisions for decades and decades and decades. Uh, and under the 1905 Act, they were hearing similar appeals under Section 9 of the 1905 Act. And I gotta tell you, this this is the dog that never barked. Nobody, the government never even. I mean, it's like the government never thought to raise this issue. None of the judges deciding these cases ever thought, "Gee, do I have Article Three standing?" Because the person is complaining of the mere wrongful registration of a trademark. So you have this enormous body of history and practice in which nobody, prior to this case, ever thought that the mere unlawful registration of trademark ineligible subject matter that purports to impose obligations on a direct competitor not to sell a product. And that's what we're talking about, not selling a product. So an even stronger case is a case where there aren't competitors 
um, in court. But in the case of Harjo versus Pro Football, yeah. uh, where a group of Native Americans sought right. to cancel the registration of right. the Redskins trademark, right. that was brought by Pro Football into district court. It was. District court. It was. Right. And, and there was no competition, so there was no threat of uh and nobody thought that there was any Article Three problem there. But but then, how do you distinguish that case from all of the cases I can imagine, which a court would immediately say no Article Three jurisdiction? So there may be flaws to these hypotheticals. But what if I just sort of search the title registry and see that there's some piece of land that I think somebody doesn't have title to that's claiming title, and I say well, I have no no desire to own that piece of land myself or do anything with it, but I challenge your title? Or what if there's a doctor licensed to practice medicine and I think that doctor shouldn't be? <laughs> But I have no plans to see that doctor have any interactions with them. Those are the classic trying to get the court to be like a legislature or some sort of roving commission. And I agree with that. Yeah. And I think the, the correct answer to that, which came up when I got a similar hypothetical question from, I think, Justice Ginsburg, uh, is the three-part test. In order to get into court, you have to have injury. So the question in, in those hypotheticals, which, would have, which was the same question that was put to me, the hypothetical question that was put to me was, could your client have just gone into court in 2007 and sued Nike to invalidate the trademark? Uh, and my answer to the, to the justice was, well, I don't know what injury we would have had because it never even occurred to already that Nike would have a right of action against it for selling this Yum's branded shoe that is protected by its own design patent. So uh, I'm not aware of what injury we would have had uh, to go into court on. So that's, I think, the actual, the, the correct answer, is that if, if a doctor is, uh, is engaged in unlicensed practice of medicine, uh, in order for a private sector plaintiff to have the right to ask a federal court to adjudicate something, you have to have not only injury, you also have to have a right of action. But so your injury is the lawsuit and the, the threat of future lawsuits. Well, let me ask you about that, though. Yeah. So as I understand it, part of the trademark is the eyelet pattern of the Nike shoe, which seems to be an alternating, yes. right? So presumably already might care as a competitor that that eyelet pattern could be functional and would like to uh, invalidate the trademark, the registered trademark for that design. Um, could they go into district court and seek a cancellation? You're, you're, you're raising a question that is um, actually not the question before the court right now, um, but it has to do with why we have these parallel universes, these parallel Article III universes. The reason I think most people would at first brush uh, question whether uh, such a proceeding could occur is because the question they would ask you, well, what is your right of action? Let's put injury to one side. You've got to have a right of action to be enforced. So what is the right of action? Uh, and the district court in our case, I think, was thinking more about right of action, actually, than Article III standing in terms of its analysis. Um, and the reason why you have the parallel universes, in my view, uh, is that in Federal Circuit precedent, there is no right of action for someone who feels adversely aggrieved by the wrongful issuance of a patent. There just isn't one. Uh, so there could be injury, but it's damn no maps way injury. There's just no right of action. There has not been the same tradition in trademark law because Federal courts have, since at least 1946 and prior to that, under the 1905 Act, there has been statutory authority to cancel trademark registrations when there has not historically been federal court authority to expunge patents. It's a historical anomaly, but there just has not been recognized in the patent field a right of action belonging to the person seeking relief from the invalid patent that there has been for a person seeking relief from the invalid registration of a claim of right to use a trademark. So the, uh, the answer I think McCarthy would give uh, is McCarthy would say, citing a 1960 district court case in the, in the Southern District, 
uh, that a person who uh, objects to the registration of a trademark must first exhaust his administrative remedies. And only after you've exhausted your administrative remedies can you then go to district court, assuming the Second Circuit is wrong and, and there's Article III jurisdiction to hear such a claim. Uh, but I think that would be Professor uh, McCarthy's answer mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have one more trademark question. Okay, sure. Um, I, I know that By the way, the, the already shoes does not have a wavy panel, and, and, and one of the uh, one of the reasons why um, uh, I think it's a fair inference uh, uh, the uh, the Nike folks got cold feet about this suit is that the. <laughs> no <punishment>. uh, <laughs> um, infringement analysis when you're talking about something like a shoe uh, is, in my view, in total crisis. Because the liability rules for determining whether or not a word term name similar device is confusingly similar to another word term name similar device um, was not developed with a view to deciding whether or not a shoe should be deemed to infringe rights in another shoe, no matter what words, terms, names, similar devices are placed on the shoes. Yeah, it should have been designed that. And, uh, it, is, it is a form of analysis that is unbounded by claim limitations because it made no difference to the plaintiff in this case that the wavy panel wasn't there, the elongated S-cut uh, side panels weren't there. The serrated edge of the sole wasn't there. All of the things that were said to be the purported trademark, as if this was a patent with five or six specifically recited claims in them, they were absent. And yet, without being held uh, liable for sanctions, which we said this was an exceptional case, uh, it, is, it is not uncommon. In, in trademark litigation practice today for claims to be brought for infringement in which you're asserting a registration against goods or services that are outside the scope of the ID in the registration. And in the case of something like this shoe whose structure omits all of the structure, much less the combination of structure that is claimed in the registration itself as constituting the so-called mark. So what you have with this this current practice, uh, which the Supreme Court has never sustained, is a claim of trademark right to exclude that is perpetual and vastly broader than any patent could ever give its holder, ever. Uh, and I think that uh, if the Supreme Court were ever to get its hands on the merits of a case like this, uh, it would do what it did in the Sears and Comco and, uh, and, and, and traffics and other cases like this and say that mechanical configurations are patent eligible subject matter. We're not going to allow trademark law to basically render totally moot the prior art and, and all of the legal standards that govern patent, uh, patentability. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, this, is a, this is a big, big problem in my view, with uh, extending the liability rules of trademark law to things like, you know, traffic signs, uh, you know, wind-resistant traffic signs, or uh, in this case, shoes. I had a case involving the Vornado fan grill, same thing. Uh, and now, I mean, there's a judgment out in uh, California for a billion dollars. Why? Because the Samsung Galaxy phone has curved, uh, you know, curved corners and, and things like that. Bevels. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, a, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, so there are many, uh, you know, there are many, many, uh, you know, unstable issues in this, this corner of, of what is said to be trademark law. <laughs> Uh, but really is some But the Supreme some Court other. looked at one of those, which was the Taco Cabana case, in which it looked at different um, decor and physical appearance of a restaurant, and they didn't seem to have those problems with the trademark. Well, 
uh, and in the traffic case, case, the court did. sort of trivialized the holding in Taco Cabana and said it's like a tertium quid. You know, Justice Scalia is this great Latinist. You know, he uses these terms like tertium quid. Uh, that it, it was a third con. You know, so, it was a product, it wasn't packaging, it was a tertium quid <laughs> restaurant. Along these lines, I wanted to ask yeah. you about that. In the, um, in the covenant, uh, Nike uses the language colorable imitation. Mm -hmm. um, but you said that there were five claims against already, and one of those, well, two of those claims were dilution, dilution under federal mm -hmm. law and dilution under state law. Mm -hmm. uh, colorable imitation has no relationship with a dilution claim. Um, doesn't that in and of itself give already some concern about its its future business practices with regard to Nike's rights? I mean, so you don't need to have a shoe that has any colorable imitation to run afoul of dilution law or dilution protections. Yes. Well, what what was unusual about the Nike covenant is that when you talk about colorable imitation, historically, the thing being imitated is the mark of the plaintiff. But here, the definition of the license, the involuntary license, a.k.a. covenant not to sue, is we will not sue you for the shoes that exist now or colorable imitations of those shoes. Mm -hmm. They never said we're not going to sue you if you make a colorable imitation of our shoe. So the way to think about this is you have somebody who does the equivalent of putting up you know, posts public land. It says, keep out. You can't come on to this park. You can't come into this public place. And then somebody says, phooey, I'm coming in anyway. They get sued for doing what they had the right to do. And uh, the resolution is, well, I see you're standing on this one spot. I'll tell you what, I will not sue you so long as you stand on that spot. And three inches outside of it, the colorable limitations of the spot. But anything else, you go outside that circle, you know, all bets are off. And that was supposed to be uh, an act that rendered moot the claim that said well, I shouldn't be subject to this uh, burden at all. To be Nike, yes. I'm, feeling, I'm feeling adversarial. <laughs> to be Nike, all you need to do is tell me you plan to go three inches outside the spot. And you have not said that in the record. Uh, well. It just tell me you plan to do it, and then it's not moved. But you, your client won't say that, which is interesting to me, but not a trademark person, as to why that won't get. Uh, it would seem like an easy thing to say without a whole lot backing it up. Uh, there, it, it, interestingly, under the reasonable apprehension of suit test, I mean, one of the ironies of this case is the argument that Nike is making is one that would be plainly insufficient under the reasonable apprehension of suit test. In other words, there's a two-part test. You have to be in apprehension of suit, but you also have to have taken meaningful preparations towards exposing yourself to liability to the other side. So traditionally, just to say, I want to do this, wouldn't be enough. So this, this, this argument that is being made is really, I mean, as you point out, it doesn't impose any meaningful limitation on the article, and the talk is cheap. Of no, but still, what, I guess maybe this is not an answerable question by the lawyer of already, but why hasn't already said, oh, and we intend to make, or, or we at least think we might? Well, uh, as I said in, in my rebuttal remarks, already has never been asked that question in a context that at least to a trial court litter, uh, 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 lawyer uh, would be appropriate. For me to answer that question, which I was pressed on by Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kennedy and others, I couldn't possibly do that without invading the attorney-client privilege. The only personal knowledge I would have about that would be information I'd have from my client. So for me to reveal that with the client's approval would be potentially to open the door to discovery and waiver of attorney-client privilege. It's just not an appropriate thing to do for anyone experienced in litigation for a lawyer to go out and make factual representations about what his client has told him about what his, what his impressions are. So for me, not being a Supreme Court specialist who's argued 25 cases, for me being a regular guy who tries to actually do it all, 
it's odd to be asked these kinds of questions. What we did in this case was we were going at it hammer and tongue with the plaintiff. The plaintiff bailed on its own case on March 19, 2010. A week later, they filed their motion to dismiss for alleged lack of subject matter jurisdiction. And two weeks after that, we put in our evidence as to why the case was obviously not moot because they were hanging on to the very unlawful advantage that we said they weren't entitled to. And we have one case. And what we said the court should do is issue a single judgment that says they waive their claims, the mark is invalid, and the mark registration should be canceled. If the judge had done that, no one would have questioned that he had no subject matter jurisdiction to do that. Uh, and, and at least under Second Circuit precedent at that time, to make that statement would have changed nothing. Um, and so there was no, uh, it, 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 it had never been suggested in the trial court uh, at the time when we were filing these papers that such a statement would have had any legal consequence. So somebody tells me that, uh, you know, I'm remand. Uh, if, the, if the company is asked that question in deposition, I'm sure that uh, they will uh, <laughs> Uh, state the truth. Yeah, it's just the problem with the, um, it, for everything you've just said, suggests to me that remand would be the appropriate well, way to resolve Well, of course there's going to be a remand. Of course there's going to be a remand. Mm -hmm. The only issue is what is going to be the inquiry on the remand. Well, we want a remand because we want to mm -hmm. go to trial and get a judgment that this is an invalid registration. Now, of course, Nike always has the right, as any litigant does, to come in and argue that the case is moot based on evidence or whatever, but it's, it's odd for a trial court practitioner uh, to be pressed to, to make factual representations that I obviously could never testify to and I have no personal knowledge of and, uh, and it's kind of asking me to reveal what, uh, you know, what my client has told me. So that is just my instincts as a practitioner that makes me reluctant and to try to answer these questions sort of purely on logical terms that, well, you know, if, 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 if the law is uh, declared to be uh, that uh, the client has the legal right and privilege to partake of this highly, uh, you know, uh, hot selling and, and, and lucrative uh, style of shoe, well, it's, it, you'd have to be nuts not to, uh, to try to uh, partake of that. But that's not a factual representation. I'm just trying to make, uh, make the obvious observation that if the question was asked, you can probably predict what the answer would be. Let me ask you not about this case, yeah. but a case very like it. Um, so I understand from what you've said and what Professor Anderson said mm -hmm. that uh, this is not the only case like this situated in this way mm -hmm. where a rights holder, either a patent or a trademark rights holder, brings suit, sees the writing on the wall, withdraws the suit. Mm -hmm. um, what could a defendant better protect themselves in a situation like this if they uh, allege that it was frivolous, a frivolous suit, or that it was harassing litigation, would that help to keep a case or controversy? No, would not, in a word. In fact, that's what we did. And, and ironically, the counterclaim in this case had eight, fares, eight prayers for relief. The district judge adjudicated two of them. Our first prayer for relief is dismiss their complaint with prejudice, which is the worst thing that can happen to a complaint in court. And the judge granted that. So we got that. And we also asked for an award of attorney's fees because this was a frivolous suit. The judge denied that. So, so far, the judge has adjudicated 25% of the prayers uh, claims that, that are in the case. But then he says, well, I, I don't have any authority anymore to adjudicate that you didn't infringe or that the mark is invalid or any of the things that, that, mm. that you, you want. So it sort of was a, a gerrymandered jurisdictional ruling. I have jurisdiction mm. to decide this part, uh, but not the other part. So the answer to that is no. And interestingly, the counterclaim that we filed was a mirror image counterclaim. And that was thought to be the protection. Mm -hmm. In other words, in the, there were two Supreme Court patent cases uh, decided in, in like 1939 and 1943. Um, and in the one, the person accused of infringement just put up a defense. I'm not liable to you because your claim is invalid. And when a plaintiff concedes defeat in a case like that and consents to dismissal with prejudice of his claim, well then the defense may very well be moot because it can't get you any more than what you got because you just, you only, all you asked for was a judgment of non-liability to the plaintiff and you got it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. There could have been a million reasons why you weren't liable, statute of limitations, whatever, but you get that. Mm -hmm. So the reason why litigants today do what already did, which is not merely to deny, but to file a mirror image counterclaim that says, by the way, the court should declare that the claim is invalid is precisely because under Rule 41A2, which Justice Ginsburg brought up today, if you have a counterclaim like that, it denies the plaintiff the ability to pull the plug unless the counterclaim can stay in court. So that is your protection. Uh, and the first of the three cases about case was Morton International against Cardinal Chemical, in which, starting in 1987, the Federal Circuit has started holding that where you have a counterclaim like that, and the district court holds that the patent is not infringed and the patent is invalid, an alternative holding, and we come up and, uh, and we affirm, well, we're going to vacate the invalidity portion of the holding because it's moot, because we've granted judgment of non-infringement and therefore the patent is moot. And the Supreme Court said, what are you talking about? It's not moot. That was, that was the first of the three cases. We have a question for Professor Carroll. We do. Uh, thank you. And thank you for this uh, great presentation. So I actually want to ask a question to Professor Frost and then maybe uh, Mr. Sure. Dabney, you might want to respond, which is as a court watcher, when you're reading this transcript and you're sort of saying, how are the justices seeing this case in relation to a broader range of justiciability jurisprudence? There are other, for instance, I, I haven't made it through the entire transcript, but Justice Scalia is relatively silent, but he seems very sympathetic to the case on grounds, he seems to me to be seeing this as a business case and within his uh, sort of business friendly framework, thinking that a business who faces a risk because there's a, a right out there that might uh, sort of increase its cost of capital or uh, subject it to liability is a risk that gives it the kind of injury, in fact, that presents standing. But Justice Scalia has been very hostile to the idea that risk can supply standing uh, to environmental plaintiffs or other kind. So I'm wondering, should we take any comfort from that? Or is it because it's a business case, uh, risk is the, the business risk is the kind of risk that's injury in fact, whereas in environmental harm risk is not. So from your perspective, is the, are, are they speaking in, in two minds about justiciability? Will there be broader implications uh, in other fields of law? Well, it sounds like you're asking if his jurisprudence is consistent between environmental and business law cases. Um, I won't answer that question. Um, but actually, a, a couple of, of points to respond to there. One is I do think you picked up on a real, uh, a real concern of, of Scalia and I think a couple other justices, which was this point of what are we going to force already to say on the record? I think it's a real world concern. <laughs> um, and, and is the injury perhaps that in and of itself that already be forced to come back in, in order to keep the case alive and spell out to its competitor Nike and perhaps more people if they get access to the discovery, which they shouldn't under a protective order but could happen maybe what their future business plans are. And that was something I thought that bothered the justices. So there was this concern for, I think it comes up uniquely in a case like this involving two competitors, of we've got to make sure that whatever we require of a case to stay alive in federal court, it not be something that injures the competitive interests of the parties. Um, so I thought that was a, a way in which I think the case is a little different from an environmental case, perhaps, and suggested to stay alive. I also think Based on the questions, there is a suggestion that the court will continue the reasoning that it started in the Friends of the Earth case, which is what we're going to ask of you at the threshold, as a threshold matter when you bring a suit is going to be more than what we ask of you in the middle of a case. So if you invoke the power of an Article III court, that is, if you're Nike and you file your lawsuit, it's not going to be so easy for you to get rid of that lawsuit. And I think that is consistent across its jurisprudence. I mean, we saw it in Friends of the Earth, um, an environmental case. Um, and so I think that's, I, I don't want to speculate too much based on questions at oral argument, but I can see that line of reasoning continuing, which is the standing requirement at the start of the case is, is different and a higher hurdle than the requirement to keep the case in court. And, and that's for these concerns about manipulating judicial power and because a lot of the, the sort of worries that the court has about overstepping its bounds by taking on a case that's really just um, a, a hypothetical matter doesn't arise in a case that is rightfully in federal court, but then perhaps becomes moot. 
One of the strands of Justice Scalia's jurisprudence, which we put in our blue brief in this case, uh, is he seems much more uh, favorably disposed uh, to finding injury, in fact, when the person claiming injury is himself an object of the challenged governmental action, as opposed to complaining that some government official has not acted in accordance with law or something out in the environment has happened. So we have a case in which already is the directly regulated party. Mm -hmm. This registration we're challenging says, you are duty bound not to make the ship. And it's, it's pretty easy to see in the language of the cases that how could you not be injured when you are under a legal disability that you say you shouldn't be under? When, when, when you are subject to suit if you do something that you, you say you have a right to do. Uh, so I think that that may be one uh, thing that you're rightly detecting uh, that the environmental plaintiffs don't have is that they don't usually come into court saying, my freedom is restricted. The law purports to prohibit me from doing something. Nor are they brought into court as the defendant. Nor are right. they right. dragged into court and then told, oops, <laughs> nope, we didn't mean it after all now that we see you yeah. know, the, that we might suffer as well in this case. As yeah. maybe it was. I will say, though, to Professor Carroll's question, I've been to a lot of Supreme Court arguments. I've never seen one in which Justice Scalia was uh, less vocal. Right. I, think I, I counted one question, and it was tangential in, in the contract question. Right? It wasn't. Oh, it wasn't really related. He, to he asked me a softball question at the very beginning okay. when, when Justice Breyer was asking me, you know, all of these questions about where in the record is there, you know, evidence of injury and stuff. And and Justice Scalia asked me a question that was at a much more conceptual level. Isn't there obviously injury here because you're burdened right. uh, by this? But then Justice Alito didn't ask a question. Justice right. Thomas didn't ask a question. Yeah. Um, so the conservative wing was, was definitely less vocal in the argument, which I think, even, you know, if you're reading the tea leaves, it could indicate that they've already decided they know which yeah. way they're coming. They're either in support or against we, it. We haven't mentioned this, but um, I don't know who spoke more, Justice Kennedy or Justice Sotomayor. We haven't spoken about Justice Sotomayor, yeah, was, but Justice was. Sotomayor I believe, I haven't actually gone back and looked at this, but she did some IP work in New York City as a practitioner, and I got the distinct impression that she did soft, I don't want to say soft, she did, trade she did trademark uh, work, and, and her clients probably included, yeah. well, I know some people will take offense at that. I'm on the IP profs listserv, and I, I, I see, uh, I t I'm an adjunct to Cornell, so I see. You IP people in your little. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, that, 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 that's a fighting term to, to some. Uh, but, um, uh, she was asking questions that seemed to come from actual practice experience and saying, they obviously want to copy the shoe. Why should they have to tell their competitor what they're going to do? Why should they alert the market that, that, that this is the fashion direction they want to go in? She seemed very, very clued into the fact that fashion, number one, has traditionally received very little in the way of IP protection, interestingly. Uh, and also that the, the system of burdens that this covenant would put in, in which a competitor would be the servant of its rival and be needing to be worried about what its rival would approve or disapprove uh, based on pre-disclosure of future product plans was a very, very unre uh, unrealistic one. So uh, of, of the justices whose questions seemed to be uh, the most skeptical of the position that the respondent was taking, I would say she was either first or second after, mm -hmm. after Justice Kennedy in the case. Mm -hmm. She has, uh, I think, uh, you know, she has um, uh, taken, uh, you know, a, a, a view uh, like she was, she was very uh, supportive in the Microsoft I4I case. Uh, during oral arguments, she saw nothing wrong with the blanket clear and convincing evidence rule. So she has, she has tended to take a, a view that seemed to have some sympathy uh, with uh, uh, IP uh, claimants. Um, We're nearly out of time, but we do have time for some other questions. Does anyone from the audience have any other questions? I've got another one. <laughs> so, here's, here's Were you glaring at the rest of the audience? <laughs> He's like that gunner in class that you just can't keep the hand down. <laughs> so, so a separate question for Professor Anderson and Mr. Dabney, which is um, 
There's another line of Supreme Court jurisprudence which we sometimes characterize as a conversation between the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court. Uh, and when we've talked about this being a patent case in disguise, the, one of the significant points about that is the Federal Circuit has exclusive national jurisdiction over claims of patent infringement and therefore sometimes develops its own uh, uh, jurisprudence that is not tested by the other circuits because it occupies the field of patent law. And periodically the Supreme Court has to uh, remind the, the federal circuit that they are part of a, a broader federal court system and that the national <laughs> rules of constitutional law and administrative law apply even in the patent field. And, I, and, and I'm hearing that, that the, this is another area where this, the federal circuit has developed its own line of uh, sort of its own interpretation of Article Three of the Constitution. Is the, are the, how, I didn't see from the transcript that I saw a lot of sort of direct uh, addressing of is this another time when we have to supervise the Federal Circuit. Um, to what extent is that really what this case is about from your, because here it's a, an appeal from the Second Circuit, but you're saying the Second Circuit did not apply the generalized Article Three test because it was influenced by this other line of precedent that it thought it it was persuasive. To what extent is this really about supervising the Federal Circuit rather than articulating a, a new, uh, the, the sort of justiciability standards? Uh, I'm happy to, I mean, whichever. Sure, I mean, um, Jim can talk more about how much he thinks it, it covers. I mean, I think it, it, it points directly to what the Federal Circuit's doing, right? And to, and to be fair to the Federal Circuit, um, this is, a, I think, a circumstance that is not unique to IP, but is very common in IP and I think in, not in other areas, right? We have someone who has sued someone and then said, no, just joking, I don't want to sue you. And the defendant says, wait, I still want to stay in court, right? That, that's very common with patents because you're, you're fighting about property rights, very common with, or somewhat common with trademarks. Um, so the Federal Circuit has both a unique jurisdiction and they see unique cases, right? So there's sometimes that, that their unique jurisprudence has some justification. Um, but I think, I mean, this case, you, you'll tell me more about how much litigation goes on with trademarks, but this is a, this is a huge area for patents, right? Um, with patent trolls, there are a lot of times you want to get into court, but you don't want to be in Texas. You want to be some, anywhere else. So if you can file first, uh, that's a huge advantage. But that often depends on is there a case or controversy? Uh, what, is, what does that boil down to? So I can say for patent law, you could have potentially very large uh, you heard earlier that this evasive maneuver started in 1995 in a Federal Circuit case called SuperSAG. The rule that was applied in this case is a corollary of the reasonable apprehension of suit test. You give a covenant not to sue, the receiver of the covenant is not an apprehension of suit, ergo there is no controversy anymore. That principle was thought to have been abrogated in the Metamune case in 2007. But as happened immediately after the Cardinal Chemical case in 1993, the Federal Circuit found a way to interpret Supreme Court precedent in a way that resulted in the continuation of what had been going on before. And the case that was uh, prominently cited in our cert petition and in our blue brief is a case called Benetech Australia versus Nucleonics, uh, in which post metamune the Federal Circuit adheres to the Super SAC rule over the strenuous dissent of Judge Dyke, who says that the Super SAC rule is no good. This is a mootness case. There's different standards that apply to mootness. You're not following Supreme Court precedent and so forth. And so our, our view in arguing for cert was Judge Dyke had the correct interpretation. The Super SAC rule is dead. You should not be applying the Super SAC rule anymore. Uh, and, and the Second Circuit, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the great weight of authority uh, in, involving this are patent cases which all answer to the Federal Circuit. So it seems if you just count the numbers, can all of these district judges be wrong in, in applying the majority opinion to Benetech? So this is, in a sense, uh, an indirect uh, review of a rule of jurisdiction which did originate in the Federal Circuit. 
So, so yeah. I just want to uh, address one thing that Professor Anderson said about why this would be very prevalent in patent cases. And I wonder if trademark cases would be slightly different. So in trademark, because there's doctrines of abandonment, that if you uh, know of infringing uses of your mark and don't take action against them, you could be deemed to abandon, or you might <laughs> have a weakness, a, a lack of strength in the mark. I wonder if there would be as many uses of this strategy in trademark law, and my guess is that there would be less. Right. We would and see it less in I trademark think that's, law. I think that's right. I mean, some of the questioning today uh, revolved around this issue about what Nike could have done uh, to divest the court of jurisdiction. And part of the problem they run into is, well, they don't want to look like they've abandoned the mm -hmm. mark by you know, letting everyone use it. Uh, in patent law, you don't have the same concerns. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you get, you know, at, at a fundamental level, when a competitor seeks and gets favorable government action that disadvantages its competitors, our tradition is judicial review is available. You get, you have, to, if you want to hang on to the benefit, you should be required to defend it. And what this covenant maneuver purports to provide for is it allows the holder of the covenant to escape judicial review and to avoid review of, of the lawfulness uh, of the benefit uh, by selectively picking off uh, someone who would who would otherwise have the ability to seek uh, to seek his invalidation, and so this is why I answered no to Justice Roberts is that you can't have it both ways. If you want to get out of this case, remedy my injury, eliminate all of the duties and burdens and disadvantages and risks that you're exposing me to. But but you can't continue to subject me to that and just give up the meritless claims that you never had to begin with. I mean, from the petitioner's point of view, the waiver of claims by Nike changed nothing because they never had any claims. So of course they're going to waive their claims. Uh, so it, it, it just is, uh, you know, they had these narrow rights of action that say, well, I'm entitled to a judgment relief because you did this. And then there's much broader government register claim that says I have the right to exclude competition in the sale of this shoe. Not really a right to exclude competition in the use of a mark. You, you, enforcement of that registration means you can't sell that product under any mark. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, it just seems kind of fundamental. You know, fundamental. You know, first principles of judicial review that uh, you shouldn't be able to to, to to get this benefit and and avoid having to defend whether you're entitled to keep it. That's all. So it was very simple. Well, as the lawyers for Nike are not present, you have the last word. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank you so much for coming well, uh, this it's afternoon and sharing, to be here. Uh, to sharing the argument and your perceptions of it. And thank you all for attending. All right. Thank you. Thank you.